is more Torah than politics. Um, and we are going to do some Jewish learning around these crucial issues because uh, we are fortunate that our scholar is both a political theorist and a Torah scholar and a whole range of other talents and abilities. And um, someone who is very thoughtful, as always, um, when we deal with sensitive matters, we have VBM Hevra, who are VBM friends, who are to the left on this issue and to the right on this issue. And that's what it means for us to be a pluralistic Jewish institution is that we don't ask people to actually quiet their passion and their principles. We ask you to bring those. We just ask to create space for other people's passion and their principles. Being pluralistic doesn't mean watering down our truth. It means creating space for other people to hold their truth. And so that is always the case in our learning here. And so we hope that um, the learning, however it uh, triggers you, excites you, raises new questions, raises new learning, raises new dialogue for us to be more thoughtful Jews, more thoughtful Americans, uh, more thoughtful participants in building our local community. And so um, I'm excited about this learning. I'm excited about our chance to learn with the scholar, uh, Danny Gordis, and excited about uh, honoring the Hammermans today. And so we're going to hear um, the, uh, the Hammerman tribute and our introduction to uh, Rabbi Dr. Daniel Gordis from um, Stan and Cheryl's uh, son, Eli Hammerman, who was born in Phoenix, and he, where he graduated from Chaparral High School. He was an active member in Bethel's USY and graduated from the University of Arizona. So through and through Arizona, receiving degrees in political science and Jewish studies, where he works with government contractors focusing on national security in Washington, DC. And he lives in Arlington, Virginia with his wife, Julie, and their children, Noah and Molly. Having met Eli, I can say he's a mensch, uh, like his parents, and let's now hear from him. Good morning, and thank you, Rabbi. The Hammerman Lecture, now in its fifth year, was established to honor my parents and their commitment to Jewish learning in the Phoenix Jewish community. My parents' involvement in Jewish life is something that was so infused in our daily lives. Looking back, it's quite an impressive list of accomplishments. To name a few, my father was president of Bethel Congregation, founding member of Ortio, and of course, a founding member of Valley Ben Midrash. My mother was Jewish Federation Woman of the Year, a United Synagogue board member, and today serves on the Jewish Film Festival board. That, of course, is in addition to raising the three of us and balancing their full-time day jobs. They didn't do this for their resume. They did it because it was important to them to help build the Jewish community in Phoenix and to set an example for their children. Their passion to learn was passed on to the next generation, with more than half of their children dedicating their careers to education and earning PhDs in Jewish history. One of the things I respect most about my parents is the friendships they have made and the Jewish community they have helped build in the 40 plus years of living in Phoenix. I have fond memories of falling asleep to the smell of popcorn and the sounds of friendly debate among my parents' havara. I respect the fact that politics have never gotten in the way of their friendships, even as the world has become more polarized. The past several months have been challenging for all of us, but my parents never skipped a beat maintaining their busy social life with virtual Mahjong games, our family Zoom trivia night, attending Zoom classes with the Federation, streaming Saturday morning services at Ortione, and of course, attending virtual Valley Bay Midrash events. I look forward to hopefully in the very near future gathering the entire family together and belatedly celebrating your 50th wedding anniversary. I have the honor this morning of introducing Dr. Daniel Gordas as this year's Hammerman Family Lecture Speaker. Dr. Gordas is a senior vice president and the Coret Distinguished Fellow at Shalom College in Jerusalem. Since moving to Israel in 1998, Dr. Gordas has written and lectured throughout the world on Israeli society and the challenging challenges facing the Jewish state. His writing appeared in magazines and newspapers, including the New York Times, the New Republic, and Noman Magazine, among others, as well as winner of the National Jewish Book Award. The Ford has called him one of the most respected Israel analysts around. In 2014, the Jerusalem Post listed him as one of the world's 50 most influential Jews. Gordas's newest book, We Stand Divided, The Rift Between American Jews and Israel, offers a voice of reason in politically charged times, both here and in Israel. Thank you, Dr. Gordas, for joining us virtually today for these, during these strange and difficult times. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gordas.
Thank you so much, Eli. Beautiful, beautiful message. And we are excited to have Rabbi Dr. Daniel Gordas. The plan is we're going to hear from him for about 50 to 60 minutes, have the chance to listen to him for 50 to 60 minutes. And then we will move to a Q&A for the last 30 to 25 to 35 minutes, of which, given that we, we intend to have over 100, well over 100 people on the call, on the learning, will be best if you send me, you can send it to the whole group, but you're welcome just to send to me your question, which I can then field. Um, and if you wish to speak your own question, you can send that to me as well. Uh, we probably won't get to have that opportunity, but in the event that we do, that, that chance will be there as well. So uh, thank you, Rabbi Gordas, for joining us. Thank you very much, Rabbi, uh, for having me. It's, a great, it's really a very great honor. So I first want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, join in honoring the Hammerman family. It's really an honor for me to be part of this series. Uh, and before we get started, I will just say what everybody on the call already knows, uh, which is that um, Reb Shmuley is really one of the really important religious voices in America these days. Uh, we are living in a world, and you in America, me in Israel, people who will probably watch this from lots of different continents, uh, we're living in a world in which moderation and nuance, uh, care, mor moral voices are increasingly either silenced or strident. Uh, and I think what's extraordinary about the role that Rabbi Yankalevich plays in American Jewish life, but by virtue of technology really around the world, is that his is a voice of deep Jewish passion, uh, but very serious universal concern uh, for all sorts of political and moral issues that are facing people, especially in the States, have an enormous amount of regard for the work that you do, Rabbi. So it's uh, really a great honor for me to be a very, very small part of uh, your overall program and play some role in, in the, what for you is this morning and for what for me is this evening's uh, conversation. And I really do hope that it will be a conversation and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Let me say a little bit first about uh, what it is that I want to talk about. Then I'm actually going to share my screen so you are not punished by having to look at me for the entire time. Um, these are, as, as Eli said, these are tough times. These are difficult times for all of us in a whole array of ways. And uh, they're tough politically, they're tough uh, for many people economically, tragically, they're tough for many people medically and health-wise. Uh, these are very difficult times in a whole array of ways, and we're all finding ourselves, by virtue of our being cut off from people that we care about and people that we love, people who, with whom we work, uh, we're finding ourselves having to dip deep into the wells of resilience, resilience of all different sorts. Uh, but what I want to actually talk about together tonight is, is Jewish resilience. And I want to ask ourselves, uh, ask us to ask ourselves, how has the Jewish people found its secret to resilience? What has it been that has enabled us to keep ourselves going over this course of obviously millennia? And then ask about American Jewish life specifically, is something changing in American Jewish life or has perhaps already changed uh, that might impact American Jews' ability to perpetuate that kind of resilience. So I'm going to start with some quote unquote, you know, more or less um, current events. I mean, current being the last few years in Jewish life last few years was yesterday. Start with some, some basic current events. Uh, then I want to talk about what, what we can learn from some of these current events and, and so forth. And we'll take it from there. So I'm going to begin by starting my sharing my screen, but I will be back uh, a little bit later. So this should work. There we go. Okay. Just gonna get rid of this. Okay. So um, here's what I'd like to begin by, by doing. I want to start by looking at a couple of incidences that I think most people here remember. There may be a few very young people who might have been um, very young when some of these things happen, but most of us, I would imagine, remember some of these incidences very well. Uh, this first one is the very famous, tragic, horrifying Sabaro pizza bombing in the summer of 2001. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I would imagine that many of us can remember where we were when we heard about this. Uh, I certainly can. I know exactly where I was standing uh, when I first heard about this. And it was really in the, of course, it was in the middle of the Intifada, but it was really one of those, one of those moments in Jerusalem life that one really never forgets. It was one of the most horrific attacks uh, of, the, of the Intifada. And, but all I want to show you is here is two headlines from the newspapers about a month apart, um, a little bit more than a month, but basically about a month. Uh, the first one on the left-hand side is the August 10th uh, headline from, it happens to be the New York Times, but I mean, it was in every newspaper in the West. Uh, a lot of people were killed, more than 14 of the end died uh, from the suicide attack. And a month later, uh, much less covered, but not, um, not unimportant in any way because we're gonna be talking about resilience, is that the Suicide Jerusalem Pizza Shop reopened 
as a stand against terrorism. That it reopened is, okay, important. Uh, that it reopened as a stand against terrorism is interesting. That it reopened a month later is actually extraordinary. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, don't do it now, but after our conversation, if you want to Google it, you can go online and you can see the horrifying pictures of what actually happened in August of 2001 there in Jerusalem on the corner of King George and Jaffa Street. So those of you who know Jerusalem know what a central uh, intersection that is. It opened a month later. They kept crews going around the clock, obviously except for Shabbat, uh, to make sure that this thing could reopen. And it was really a very important thing for the owners and for Jerusalem in general for people to see this kind of a stand. And I'll show you another example of this. This was in a, a very sad case it also during the Intifada. The Intifada, just to remind you, starts around the Yamim no Ra'im, around the high holidays of 2000 and ends towards the end of 2004. So it goes, some people say beginning of 2005, depending on how you count, but it goes for about four years, uh, give or take. Uh, so here was another case of another exploded restaurant. This one was the Maxim restaurant in Haifa, which was known actually for being a place that both Jews and Arabs frequented. And if you notice on the left-hand side, it says that it was in October 4th that it was bombed. And you'll already see that on the right-hand side, December 8th, uh, it was renewed. So October, November, December is less than, it's three months, uh, three months and four days to be exact. And Maxim opens up once again. Really pretty extraordinary. Now, you, you, let's leave Israel. Let's cross the ocean back to the United States. Uh, and, and look at something that we all remember because it's a little bit more than a year ago, not even, not even two years ago, uh, Hanukkah of 2019. This was the horrifying attack that many of us remember uh, from Muncie, New York, where a Hasidic shul rabbi's house uh, was attacked. And, uh, you know, he came in screaming, I'm going to get you. We had a machete. Uh, he wounded a number of people. And as you can see below, uh, one of the victims, a rabbi, uh, passed away three months after the attack. Uh, and so forth. Now what I'm going to show you on the next slide, and I hope you'll be able to hear it also, uh, is a pretty extraordinary thing. So let me just take you over to this now. This is from a, uh, this is a tweet from one of the local, uh, local members of the, uh, of the group there, and um, of that community, and he posted this, and I'm going to play the video for you in just a second, but look at what he writes for us. Right after the Muncie stabbing, the rabbi and his father or followers gathered in the synagogue next door to his house where the attack took place and continued the celebrations. It was a Hanukkah celebration, Motzei Shabbat, so it was a kind of a combination of a Malava Malka and a Hanukkah celebration, and they were singing this song. So when you watch the video, what I want you to try to keep in mind is that this is happening barely minutes after a horrifying attack. And those of you that have seen the photographs of what the rabbi's house actually looked like, I mean, it was splattered with blood and people were horribly injured and the ambulances came, they took people away. And as soon as the last ambulance had left and a few people actually had chased the getaway car to uh, write down the license plate, which was instrumentally important in actually capturing the assailant not long thereafter, uh, but as soon as all that had happened and the people had been cleared out and taken to the hospital and so on and so forth, the rabbi said everybody should go to the shul next door. And I want you to see what unfolded. This is within probably a half an hour of, of this horrifying attack in, in Muncie. <laughs> So I don't think it needs, one needs to say a tremendous amount to say about how astonishing that scene is. In other words, that's the kind of powerful singing that we see at, at all different kinds of things, uh, but we would not ever in our wildest imagination imagine that transpiring just minutes after an attack like this. So what we've seen is in the Zionist world, in the Israeli world, uh, this response of immediately rebuilding, and there are obviously infinite number of examples that one could have tragically taken from Israel, uh, getting back on its feet very, very quickly. And here's an example, not from Israel, but from the uh, very, very religious community in the United States. It happened to be Muncie, but it could have been also a lot of different places. Now, I want to show you in the next slide something very different. But before I do so, I want to make very clear uh, that it's, it's critically important for me to make it clear that this is not meant in any judgmental kind of way what I'm going to show you next. Uh, it's just a very, very different kind of response. Uh, how 
individual communities respond to catastrophe like this, how individual communities respond to tremendous adver adversity, pain, loss, suffering uh, is very nuanced, can be very private, uh, has a whole array of factors that come in. So none of these instances are entirely, entirely comparable, uh, but nonetheless, I think uh, it's worth it to, for us to take a look at this next incident. Uh, and again, this may be one of those moments where we can all remember where we were. Uh, this is, of course, the, the horrifying attack uh, in October of 2018 in Pittsburgh, in the Squirrel Hill section of Pittsburgh, at the Tree of Life Synagogue. So 11 people were killed in a synagogue massacre. The subject was charged with 29 counts. Uh, and then you can see that there's no date on that New York Times article, but it's October 2018. And then you can see below uh, October 2019, the end of October 2019, which was a year later. And when I saw this headline, it was the first time that I actually paid attention to the fact that the shul hadn't reopened. Uh, and we're now obviously in August of 2020, and October 2020 is not that far away. And this, the, the shul is still closed. And the plan has been, and I don't want to go into all of the details here, but they've hired a, a firm to help them uh, hire an architect who's going to, they're going to do a massive redo of the, of the building. And they want to make sure that when people go back into the building, it doesn't look like it did as it did during the day of that massacre, because they don't want to have to confront, understandably, uh, the horror of what transpired. But you have here really two very, very different kinds of responses to tragedy, responses to trauma, responses to travail. You have on the Israel Zionist side and in the, what I would call, you know, hardcore religious community, you have this instinct of rebuilding immediately, which does not seem to have happened in this example here in Pittsburgh, and many other examples, by the way, not most of them in, in the United States, thank God, but, but in other places around the world. And what I want to begin to ask is, why is that the case? Uh, so here is an image that I'll just say for the sake of being a totally apparent, it's stolen from the New York Times. But this is a great image that the New York Times has actually used uh, for resilience. So striking down roots and withstanding the blowing winds and so forth. Uh, and what I want to ask for a little bit now is, from where do these abilities of resilience, from where does the wellspring of resilience in the Jewish world really come? If we look at that Muncie community, or if we look perhaps at the Zionist community, though there I think it's a little bit different, but where Jews over the thousands of years have found resilience, where does it really come from? And I want to be, here we want to turn our way away from a little bit of uh, current events, so to speak, and turn our attention a little bit more to Torah, look at a few sources, and I want to make a claim about the way that Jews view history, that Jews traditionally view history, and argue that it's that traditional view of history which is key to our core of resilience. So let's start now with the Tachanun prayer, uh, which some of you are probably familiar with, and I'll just read you a couple of passages. These are very brief passages. Tachanun on Mondays and Thursdays is actually fairly lengthy. We say it Normally, it's not a prayer reserved for a particular time of the year. There are actually a few periods of the year when we don't say it. Uh, but on a typical, typical, normal, every day, uh, on Mondays and Thursdays, it's, it's, it's fairly long. Uh, and on other days, it's somewhat shorter. We don't say it on Shabbat and holidays. Uh, but it's a lot longer than this. And just look at a couple of the quotations here. So, Lord our God, do not be distant for us, for we are worn out by the sword and captivity, by pestilence and plague, by every trouble and sorrow. And it goes on. These are really very brief quotes of much longer uh, citations. The second one, for you, Lord, we wait. For you, Lord, we hope. For you, Lord, we long. Do not be silent while we suffer. For the nations are saying their hope is lost. We're your people. And the nations are looking at your people and they're saying about us, that our hope is lost. And the only way for us to show that our hope is not lost is for you not to be silent anymore. Help us, help us withstand this, help us stop and put an end to the suffering and so forth. And then the third one continues this. Look on our affliction, habita be'onyenu, for many are our sufferings and heartaches, ki rabu mach ovenu, v'tzarot levavenu, have pity on us, chusa Hashem aleinu, v'al tishpoch harancha aleinu, have pity on us, Lord, in the land of our captivity, do not pour your wrath out on us. In other words, God, please stop this outpouring of wrath. Now, if I hadn't told you at the beginning that this was taken from the daily Tachanun prayer, 
and I had asked you when you weren't familiar with it, let's just hypothetically say that, you know, some people on the call weren't familiar with Tachanun, which is perfectly understandable. Uh, and I would have said, when is this from? You know, you might have guessed, I don't know, this is the ninth of Av, the Tisha B'Av, when we mourn the destruction of the temples, which we'll come back to a little bit later. Uh, you might have imagined that it's for a terribly sad day in the Jewish calendar, maybe the 17th of Tammuz, when we mourn the breaching of the walls, or, or, or the 10th of Tevet, when we mourn the beginning of the siege on Jerusalem, or the fast of Esther, when we fast because of the vulnerability of diaspora life, as is described in the book of Esther. You know, you would have been quite understandably, it would have been a, a defensible position to say, oh, this must come from one of those terrible days. But it doesn't. This is part of the daily liturgy. And what I want to try to suggest, therefore, is that this has something to do with how we Jews look at history. Let me give you one or two other examples, and then we'll try to say a little bit about what I think it actually might say about the Jewish view of history. So we're going to leave the liturgy, we're going to leave the world of the prayer book and the Siddur, and we'll turn now to the Talmud um, for one source, and then we're going to look at, at another source in the Talmud and then go back to the liturgy for a second. But here's a source from the Talmud in Brachot. Since Brachot is uh, the first tractate of the Talmud, uh, and it starts on page 2a, uh, this is pretty, pretty close to the very, very beginning of the entire Babylonian Talmud. Tanya, Rabbi Shima ben Yochai, Omer Shalosh Matanot Tovot, Antana HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael, V'kulan lo netanan ela al yedei surin, Elohim Torah v'eretz Yisrael v'haolam haba. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai says, The Holy One, blessed be He, gave the people of Israel three precious gifts. And here's the important point. All of which were given only by means of suffering. In other words, what are these three gifts? We'll list them first. Torah, the land of Israel, and the world to come. Now think about the Jewish worldview and think of the worldview of the rabbis of the Talmud. What could be more important? than the Torah, the land of Israel, and the world to come. Nothing. So what the Talmud is saying there essentially is, is that everything that matters comes to us by way of suffering. In other words, and here we can tie it back to Tachrun that we saw on the previous slide, suffering is not the abnormal. Suffering is not a breach of the norm. Suffering is part of the fabric of life. And once we understand suffering as part of the fabric, at least of Jewish national life, then we're not terribly shocked when it happens. It doesn't mean that we're not horrified that it happens. It doesn't mean that we're not heartbroken when it happens, but we're not surprised. We're many, many things, but we're not surprised. And so built into the nature of the world is suffering as far as the rabbis are concerned. Uh, let's look and see what they say. It comes up in a few places, this quote but this is just one of them, on Sanhedrin 99a. For Shmuel says, the difference between this world and the Messianic era. So this world that we live in now, and the Messianic era, this idyllic time that we dream of and pray for, what's the difference between these two periods, ours and that one, the period of the Messiah? There is only one difference, Shmuel said, which is Shibud Malchuyot. It's our being subservient to foreign kingdoms. That's all. Everything else about the world that we don't like here is going to continue. There is going to be illness, he seems to suggest, in the Messianic era. There is going to be poverty, he seems to suggest, in the Messianic era. There are going to be orphans, he seems to suggest, in the Messianic era. Everything that makes us sad about this world, everything, going to the hospital and seeing wards of children who are sick, long before they should have been sick the way that human life normally works. The things that leave us just heartbroken. Shmuel seems to say that that's going to happen even in the messianic world also. Only one thing is going to change. The only thing that's really going to change is that the Jewish people are not going to be subservient to foreign kingdoms. That's how much this loomed in the rabbi's conception of the world in which they live. That's how much this loomed in the rabbi's conception of reality. Go back to Tachanun, go back to Brachot on the previous slide with the three things that God gave us, which are so treasured, Torah, land of Israel, and the world to come, and they were all given by suffering. In other words, only by suffering can we get this. And Shmuel says that kind of suffering that comes to us because of hatred of, of, of the Jewish people by other peoples, that's the only thing that's going to change. That's how much they were focused on this particular, uh, this particular dimension of Jewish life. Now I want to go back to the, um, the Sidur for a second. 
This is a passage from Av HaRachamim. If you look at the very long English and the very short Hebrew, uh, you have already figured out, I'm sure, uh, that the English is a more complete quote, and the Hebrew I just took a very small amount because I just wanted to fit it all on one screen in the size that you could read. Um, but this appears right as we're putting the Torah away on Shabbat. The Torah has just been put away. We say Av HaRachamim on Shabbat. We don't say it every single Shabbat. Quite interestingly, by the way, we don't say Av HaRachamim on a Shabbat if that particular day and that particular period had been a weekday and we wouldn't have said Tachanun. In other words, we never say Tachanun on Shabbat and we only say Av HaRachamim on Shabbat. But if that's a period of the year in which we don't say Tachanun, we also don't say Av HaRachamim. There's some, other there's some other exceptions in both directions. Um, but here's what we say, Av HaRachamim Shochein Bam Romim, Berachamav Atsumim Hu Yifkod Berachamim HaChasidim Vayesharim Vatmeimim, this was apparently written in the early Middle Ages after the Crusades. It's an addition to the Sidur, uh, given the horror of the Crusades. And look how this goes further than just saying that suffering is part of the world in which we live. We'll see what it says. Father of compassion who dwells on high, may you remember in your compassion the pious, the upright, and the blameless, holy communities who sacrificed their lives for the sanctification of God's name. Lovely and pleasant in their lives, in death they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles and stronger than lions to do the will of their maker and the desire of their creator. Now listen to this, follow along carefully here. O oh our God, remember them for good with the other righteous of the world, and may you exact retribution for the shed blood of your servants, as is written in the Torah of Moses, the man of God. O nations, acclaim his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, wreak vengeance on his foes, and make clean his people's land. Here is a request of God for revenge. Uh, and, I, and I feel comfortable saying, because it was a very public thing, uh, you know, I grew up in a, in a traditional shul, and we said this, obviously, every Shabbat that you were supposed to say it, uh, and I never paid it one bit of attention. I mean, I said it, but I didn't really think that much about it uh, until I got to college uh, in New York and I started to, to go to shul some Shabbat mornings at the Jewish Theological Seminary, uh, the conservative, the, the headquarters of the conservative movement, which back then in the late 70s was a, a very, very, very traditional worship. Uh, you know, men and women sat separately, the, the whole shebang. It was a very, it was a very traditional place. Uh, and one of the people who was really one of the great intellects of the seminary back then, of JTS back then, thank God still alive, though quite old and not really actively teaching anymore, was Professor David Weiss Halivni, who was himself a survivor of the Holocaust, uh, an incredible story, really a great scholar, even at a young age, whose parents were, he was thrown out of the train car uh, after he was, a, it's a long story, but he survived and he came to America and lived a very long life till he moved to Israel a number of decades ago, and he would always sit in the front row of this shul. And I didn't yet know who he was, but I heard as we were saying Av HaRachamim relatively quietly, that every time the word of vengeance, revenge, nekama, yikom, etc., etc., any time of any version of that root came up in this prayer, there was this piercing voice coming from the front of the shul that cried out these words. And I was a freshman in college, I had no idea who he was. And eventually I said to someone, who is that who, who recites the prayer that way? And they told me his name and at, at around the same time, actually, uh, the New York Times came out with a, a magazine section story about him. He was on the front cover of the New York Times magazine, which told his whole story. So you can find it uh, online. And that prayer began to haunt me in a different kind of way, because here was a man who had lost everything and everyone in Auschwitz, had barely survived himself. And I got to sit in shul with him saying, Av HaRachamim, Shabbat after Shabbat after Shabbat, with this piercing cry of asking God for vengeance, for retribution, and so on and so forth. And I began to, understood that that's, to understand that that's also part of the way in which we think about history as Jews. We don't paper over the fact that there is tremendous suffering. We don't paper over the fact that all of the good things that God gives us may come through suffering. We say that suffering is so critically essential in terms of being central, you know, not important in a positive way, but central in a taking up space way to the world in which we live, 
that that's what's going to change between now and the Messianic era and not anything else. And then even comes this prayer for vengeance. Now you might say, well, okay, I mean, you know, it, it finds itself into the liturgy in the Middle Ages after the Crusades. I can understand that. Uh, but luckily, you know, we'd say about ourselves, well, just don't do that. You know, vengeance is not the kind of thing that we do, uh, which thankfully is usually true, uh, but it's not always entirely true. So I just want to share with you for one moment uh, the picture of Abba Kovner, uh, who died not that long ago, um, you know, I guess 33 years ago. It's already been some time. Uh, he was one of Israel's leading poets in his, in his later years. Uh, and working backwards, he was in the IDF when he first got to Israel. Uh, this is a picture of him standing in the very middle of the back row. Uh, that's him as a young man uh, when he was in the Vilna ghetto and part of a group of Jews who chose to try to defend themselves in the Vilna ghetto. But what's interesting about Abba Kovner and our conversation was that after the war, uh, he and a group of friends founded a group called Nakam, which means the Avengers, basically. And their plan, which was discovered um, and therefore prevented, was to take retribution against the Germans by poisoning the wells of Hamburg, Frankfurt, Munich, and Nuremberg with poison that they actually were able to get. They acquired the poison, but they were arrested before they could put it in. They wanted to kill six million Germans. And when other people beyond Kovner, other members of this plot, uh, were interviewed in later years as Israelis, and you can find this again online, they said, yeah, we didn't really care if it was guilty Germans or non-guilty Germans. We didn't really care if it was a child German or an adult German. We wanted retribution. They killed six million of us. We were gonna kill six million of them. Now, we again can take a huge sigh of relief that that plot never came to fruition because it would have made a lot of things a lot worse and would have been a horrible human tragedy in addition to everything else. But there is this sense in at least part of the Jewish world uh, that this idea that we saw in Av HaRachamim here uh, is actually something that some Jews might want to actually enact. Thank God, you know, usually it doesn't happen. Now, so we've seen in the Sidur, at least, we have Tachanun and we have Av HaRachamim, two prayers that talk, one, about the centrality of our suffering and one about are therefore asking God to exact retribution or vengeance on behalf of the Jewish people. Now, what happens? These are um, blurry, I apologize, but these are covers of two recent Sidurim, two recent prayer books uh, that have come out in the United States. Uh, Mishkan Tfilah on the top left is a reform Sidur, and Lev Shalem on the bottom right is a new conservative Sidur. Now, the conservative Sidur Sim Shalom that came out, uh, I guess about 40 years ago already, probably, uh, had Avar Rachamim and Tachanun in it, Lev Shalem, the one on the bottom right, which is because it's a Sidur for Shabbat, won't have Tachanun because you don't say Tachanun on Shabbat, so that's understandable. But it also doesn't put Avar Achamim in the Sidur. It puts it at the very, very back with a note that some people kind of used to say this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, it makes it clear that the movement as a whole doesn't see this as part of the regular worship liturgy anymore. Uh, and I checked with some authorities who are really expert in the Reform liturgy much more than I am. And they are not aware of a single reform Sidur, already going back to the previous century, even in Europe, a single reform Sidur that has included either Tachanun or Av HaRachamim. In other words, modern Jews, modern Jewish movements, very much unlike, for example, the Mansi community that we saw before, where of course they say Tachanun, and of course they say Av HaRachamim, uh, more modern communities have seemingly moved away from that centrality of Jewish suffering in our assessment of the world and asking God uh, to take vengeance when necessary. And this is, of course, the big question. Why, and we're talking only about American Jews right now, why is it that in American Jews we have moved away from a world in which non-Orthodox communities, and I'm speaking, by the way, as a conservative rabbi, so I'm not dumping on anyone else. I'm speaking about my own community as much as anybody else. But why is it that non-Orthodox communities have moved away from wanting to say Tachanun? Why have they moved away from wanting to say Av HaRachamim? Why have they wanted to portray the Jewish experience in such a different way from the way that the traditional Sidur did it? And in order to try to make that claim, we're going to move at least to two people here who have nothing to do with the Jewish world at all. 
Uh, C. Van Woodward was a leading historian of, uh, of America. He was a, a great American historian, died a couple of decades ago, I think. Uh, he wrote also another book called The Burden of Southern History, which is really fabulous about the ways in which the South and the North um, looked at history very differently. And for those of you that are following, obviously, and I assume most of you are in America, uh, what's happening now, for example, with Confederate symbols and Confederate flag and statues of Lee and so on and so forth. Uh, he wrote his book long before this was an issue. Uh, but to go back and read his book, that's, read his book that's called uh, The Burden of Southern History is really a fabulous opportunity to understand how differently the North and the South understood history. But this is a book that came out after that one, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the North and the South, but it does have something to do with how he understood the American mindset. And here's one passage among many that one could have taken from this book in which he's describing how America created the worldview that it created among its citizens. So he says here, optimism presupposes a future that is unusually benign and reliable, reliably congenial to man's enterprises. Now, unusually benign and reliably congenial is the exact opposite of Tachanun, right? What Tachanun is saying is, God, our lives are anything but unusually benign, and our lives are anything but reliably congenial to our enterprises. In a certain way, though, Woodward never thought about the Jewish people, I don't think, in any way whatsoever regarding history. Uh, this is the exact opposite of what traditional Jews were saying for so many hundreds of years. Anxieties about security have kept the growth of optimism with the bounds among other peoples, like us, the Jews. We do have anxieties of security, and therefore that has kept the growth of optimism among us within bounds. But the relative abs uh, absence of such anxieties in the past has helped along with other factors to make optimism a national philosophy in America. What Woodward is saying is, and again, these are my words, not his, obviously, this is where the fork in the road comes. How do we look at history? What do we see as the default setting, the default position? The horrors that are mentioned in Tachanun and that are implied in Aharachamim, or a kind of a buoyant, reliably congenial optimism that reflects America? Well, obviously, I think you know the two different communities, the Jewish community traditionally and the American community traditionally, have very, very different takes. And you can already see where I'm going here, of course, right? I was trying to argue to a certain extent that in abandoning Tachanun and in abandoning, let's say, Avarachamim, but more than the actual liturgical pieces, in abandoning that worldview, what I think we do as Jews is we begin to weaken that resilience that has been so characteristic of us for a very long time. We'll come back to that in a minute. He says, the freedom of American youth from the long period of training and military discipline that left its mark upon the youth of nations, certainly true in Israel, where it was a routine requirement, which is still true here, could hardly have failed to make some contribution to the distinctiveness of, he means here, American national character. He's saying, unlike other countries, we don't ask our kids to serve. It's a totally volunteer army. You want to serve, you serve. You don't want to serve, you don't serve. Obviously, there have been periods of the draft. There's a draft in Vietnam. There's a draft in the Second World War. Obviously, we all understand that. But he's writing this book in a period in which the American army, as it is now, is an entirely volunteer army. Uh, when I was a kid in America, in high school, in college, and I say this without any pride whatsoever, I didn't know anybody in the American army. I didn't have a single friend or a single friend who had a sibling or a single friend who anybody in his family that I knew had actually gone to the army, even to Vietnam, because I was just a little bit too young to have peers of that era. And obviously in Israel, there's nobody who doesn't know somebody in the army. And so what Van Woodward is saying here, see Van Woodward is saying here is that this kind of optimism, this notion of an unusually benign and reliably congenial reality, that's America, he's saying. And what I'm trying to suggest here is that I think that as American Judaism has tried to become more American and has left this particular Jewish focus on our travails aside, I fear that it may be weakening our ability to bounce back, as you can see on the difference between, let's say, Israel and Muncie on the one side uh, and Pittsburgh on the other side, again, without any implied criticism of Pittsburgh in any way whatsoever, simply to say that the horror of what happened, and it was undeniably horrific, 
cause them to be in a world in which they could not go back into that shul if it looks like it did the way that it did before. Uh, whereas in Israel, obviously, you know, we rebuild the restaurants very often, literally overnight, if possible, replace the glass, cleaned it up, opened up again the next day. Uh, it looks very much like it did the day before. Uh, but that's about resilience, obviously. And this is, of course, a very famous speech. Uh, there are many, many uh, American politicians who have used uh, this very, very, um, this very important phrase, the shining, shining city or a shining city on a hill or whatever. Uh, Reagan is one of the more famous ones who did it. This is his farewell speech uh, to Americans. You can find it on the Reagan archive, the Reagan uh, website. It's a very long speech. This is actually a very small piece of it. The past few days when I've been at that window upstairs, I thought a bit of the shining city upon a hill. Uh, the phrase comes from John Winthrop. By the way, Kennedy used it. Uh, Obama used it. It's been used by people of both parties uh, before Reagan, after Reagan, etc. The phrase comes from John Winthrop, who wrote it to describe the America he imagined. What he imagined was important because he was an early pilgrim, an early freedom man, right? America was about freedom, freedom from all sorts of things. He journeyed here on what today we'd call a little wooden boat, and like other pilgrims, he was looking for a home that would be free. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks, stronger than many oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and still see it. Now, obviously, the American attitude towards immigration has changed dramatically since then, but that's not where we're going with this. Reagan had this image of America as a shining city on a hill. And if I could give you just one other example, which I didn't put the quote in the slideshow, perhaps I should have. Saul Bellow has a book called Humboldt's Gift, which he wrote several in the 1960s, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe 70s, I'm not quite sure. Uh, and he says at the beginning of the book, when he's speaking about the narrator, we're speaking about this guy Humboldt, who's a Jewish immigrant to America. He said that Humboldt himself said that history was a nightmare and he had come to America to get a good night's rest. He had come to America to get out of history. Tachanun and Avarachamim say in our daily and weekly worship, we live in the thick of the messiness and the ugliness of history. And what the revised Sidurim that we saw a little bit before, these Sidurim here and many, many others in which Tachanun and Avarachamim don't appear, and there are many other examples of that, what they're saying basically is we don't want to live in that history. We came to America for a very, very different purpose. We don't want to recite the travails of Tachanun. We don't want to ask for the vengeance of Avarachamim. But what I'm suggesting to you, of course, is that comes with a price, which is perhaps something having to do with our resilience. Here's a quote from Barry Weiss's uh, book of, of about a year old, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. And here she's quoting uh, Joachim, Fentz, uh, Joachim Fest, who was a, um, a, a German intellectual book critic and so forth. And he himself was recalling his father, who was a Catholic, and you see here, adamant anti-Nazi. And here's what his father's, here's what Fest's father said about his Jewish friends, right? So Barry Weiss, who's very well known these days, is quoting Joachim Fest who was quoting his father, who was talking about the Jews that he knew back in the 1930s. And his father said this, in their self-discipline, their quiet civility and unsentimental brilliance, they had really been the last Prussians. They had only one failing, he said, which became their undoing. By being overwhelmingly governed by their heads, they had intolerant Prussia lost their instinct for danger, which had preserved them through the ages. In other words, we have an instinct for danger, Fest, who I'm sure never read a Sidor in his life, but he understood the Jews well enough to know that we had an instinct for danger. We had an understanding that danger was always lurking around the corner. And that's why when it happened, when tragedy happened, when travail came upon us, we weren't shocked. We were horrified, but we weren't surprised. So when the rabbi says, Let's go next door to the shul a few minutes later. We can actually sing a verse that says that God's mercies have not failed us. How can we sing that? Because we're all here. Yes, 
It's true. Some people were taken to the hospital, and yes, it's true. Horribly, one of them would eventually die. But we're all here, the verse is seemingly saying. And the rabbi said, that's what we're going to sing. Because we had an instinct for danger, and an instinct for danger meant a sensibility about the inevitability of this kind of horror, which meant that 30 minutes later, you leave the rabbi's house, you walk literally next door to the synagogue, and in the aftermath of a horror that would have left anybody else paralyzed, you begin to sing that way. I just want to give you a couple of other examples quickly of ways in which I think American Jews have been very reticent to embrace the horrors of history which Jews have always said are part of the reality of the world. Uh, Jonathan Sarner, professor at Brandeis University, an extraordinary academic, uh, has a book called American Judaism, which is by far uh, the finest one-volume history of American Jews. Uh, came out a number of years ago, just came out in a new revised edition. And here's what he writes about in 1941. What did unite, he's writing about the beginning of the Holocaust. What did unite American Jews at the time was a sense of depression and sadness, even despair. The editor of the Jewish Publication Society, which has actually been um, subsumed now by the University of Nebraska Press, but many of you who are my age or older uh, may remember those days of the JPS when you get catalogs and it was a very well-known bar mitzvah gift to give and you give a kid a certain number of points and she or he could you know, pick whichever book they wanted. Um, they were concerned about the psychological effect of so much bad news on the Jewish community's morale. So the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, decided in response to call a halt to terrorizing the Jewish population in the country and preemptively rejected several manuscripts dealing with Jewish persecutions in Europe. In other words, the JPS, the Jewish Publication Society, just said that we're terrorizing American Jews, so we're not going to publish books about what's happening in Europe. In 1941, JPS actually published a joke book for its readers, the only one in its long history with a significant title, Let Laughter Ring. By 1943, however, there was nothing more to laugh about. The mood in Jewish circles had turned black, of course, as well it should have. Now, if there is any day on, uh, in the Jewish calendar year when we take all of these worries, all of this sensibility of inevitability of loss, and we reflect on the horrors of the past and put them all together. It is on Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, uh, where we mourn the destruction of the two temples, but we mourn more than that. And here's what the Mishnah in the Tractate of Ta'anit says we actually mourn uh, on Tisha B'Av. Time's getting a little short, so I won't read the Hebrew, but there are really five events, said the Mishnah, that happened to our ancestors on the 17th of Tammuz and five on the ninth of Av. On the 17th of Tammuz, the tablets were shattered, the daily offering was canceled, the walls of the city were breached, and a Apostomus burned the Torah and placed an idol in the temple. On the 9th of Av, it was decreed that our ancestors should not enter the land. The temple was destroyed the first and second time. Betar was captured and the city was plowed up. And therefore, when Av enters, when the month of Av begins, uh, we limit our sorrow. And what we do on Tisha B'Av, as many of you know, is we fast. It's the only 24, 25-hour fast uh, in the Jewish calendar other than Yom Kippur. Uh, the other fasts that I mentioned, the 17th of Tammuz and the 10th of Tevet and the fast of Esther and so forth, those are all sun up to sundown fasts. Uh, Tisha B'Av starts the night before, just like Yom Kippur does. And uh, we fast. Uh, we don't wear leather. We don't bathe. There are a whole lot of, a, a variety of other restrictions. Uh, but among other things, there are these dirges called kinot uh, that we sing. And here is really perhaps the most famous one. Uh, it goes on much longer than this. I mean, there must be 20 stanzas, maybe long. I know, I never counted. But uh, it's called Lament Zion, Elit Zion. Lament Zion in her cities like a woman in labor pains, like a maiden girl in sackcloth for the husband of her youth. Lament for the wounds and the many blows which her sainted ones were struck and for the smashing upon the, among the, on the rocks of her young ones. Lament for the joy of her enemy rejoicing over her downfall and for the torture of those once free, her noblemen, her pious ones. Now, uh, some of you who know the melody will respond emotionally to the melody. And those of you who don't know the melody, I think hearing the melody will give you just a sense of the profundity of this song, which I've never seen a Jewish community that does not sing Elitzion on Tish Abba'av. I just want you to hear, a, we're not going to listen to the whole thing, just hear a portion of it 
to give you a sense of it, because then I want to show you something about Elitzion in the modern era. gives you a, a little bit of an idea. And I want to show you uh, something new here. But you can see from the bottom, very right-hand corner, this is from the Open Sidur Project. Uh, and this came out literally uh, a month ago. Well, we're, we're a few weeks away. From, yeah, literally a month ago, this Tish Ab. Uh, I, I see a lot of internet traffic about a new version of Elite Sion. So what I have on the left-hand side is the traditional version, exactly the same three stanzas uh, that I showed you just a couple of minutes ago. And here's the new one on the right-hand side, which was written by uh, a modern American rabbi and, an, and another Jewish educator. Uh, well, O Zion and her cities, as Torah trapped in all of its arcs, like the ark left alone, the scroll, sorry, left alone, unread, each letter distant from her thirsty ones. For the troubles of her parents who take care of her children all day, and for the arrogance of her consumers who rush her openings. For the voices of her scorners at the time of increasing dead bodies and for social distancing and the loneliness of her people. And it also goes on. Now, as soon as you see social distancing, you understand exactly what this elitzion is about. This is an elitzion about the suffering of people, not just Jewish people, of course, people of all different sorts uh, during the horror of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, one would have to be have a heart of stone to deny the terrible suffering, the thousands and thousands and thousands of dead and those who are still precariously ill in hospitals and the, the tremendous economic damage done and the fear of many people and the loneliness of people who are shut up in their houses and apartments and old age homes by themselves. I mean, it's, a, it's we're living through a very, very, very horrible time in the world as I started out uh, by saying a, a little while ago after Eli's introduction. But here's what I, what I find extraordinary about this new elite Sion. And you see there's an asterisk above Sion. Um, and in the footnotes where it appears on this open Sidur project, you can find it online. Uh, the, the footnote there says, if you want, you can substitute the world for Zion. In other words, it's really not about the Jews. It's really not about the experiences of the Jewish people. This is the most universal thing that one can find. I mean, what is more universal than COVID, right? I mean, there's not a country in the world, there's not a, there's not a corner of the universe, on the planet at least, uh, that hasn't been, been touched by this. And so on one hand, it's a very, very interesting and noble, and by the way, the Hebrew, which was put online, is, is very, very well done, really well done. But I wonder if this isn't an, another example of what we saw in those other Sidurim, of leaving out Tachanun, and of leaving out Av HaRachamim, and of saying, we no longer want to focus even on Tisha B'Av, even on Tisha B'Av, when it's just the one day a year, the saddest day, because Yom Kippur is not a sad day, right? Yom Kippur is one of the happiest days of the Jewish year. Tisha B'Av, which is perhaps the saddest day of the Jewish year, which is devoted to thinking about Jewish suffering throughout the ages, the two temples and, of course, the Crusades, and then almost invariably the Holocaust, which I think is totally appropriate. The one day of the year that the Jewish people sets aside for thinking about its own travail, a younger generation of Jewish leaders, as I said, a recently ordained rabbi and a young Jewish educator, 
basically say, no, no, no. On Tisha B'Av, we also don't want to talk about Jewish suffering. On Tisha B'Av, we also don't want to be mired in that Jewish history. On Tisha B'Av, we also want to be talking about the world at large. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that coming back to this notion of resilience, that has to weaken Jewish resilience. In other words, our ability as a people to rebound and our ability as a people to metaphorically stand up, dust off our knees and keep marching forward has been in large measure, I think, because both in the Zionist world and in the traditional Jewish world, and they overlap, of course, to a certain extent because some Israelis are traditional Jews, but not all Israelis are traditional Jews and not all traditional Jews are Israelis. But in those two worlds, there is something not in the least bit surprising about the horrors that happen to the Jewish people because they are the Jewish people. Doesn't make it less horrifying, doesn't make it less heartbreaking, doesn't mean that fewer tears are shed. But it does, I think, serve as one of the wellsprings of resilience that's allowed us to bound back. And when I first saw uh, that Tree of Life had not reopened after all this time, that was when I first began to ask myself, well, well, why would that be? And why do I, as an Israeli who's lived here now for a little bit more than 20 years, take so much for granted that of course you open up the minute that you can? Why did it strike me as strange? That's when I began to think about the very unique take that Zionists share with traditional Jews, but that is very different from the American take and therefore the wider American Jewish take in which optimism has to suffuse uh, our view of the world. I think that optimism and that unbridled sense of potential, uh, which C. Van Woodward was talking about, are obviously incredibly wonderful things. The question is for us as Jews, do they equip us or not equip us? Or to go back to Joachim Fest, to somehow giving up on that, give up on our instinct for danger uh, that we've needed to have for so many years. So now let me conclude uh, with this one last text, because we are, of course, just a few weeks away from Rosh Hashanah, so it seemed appropriate to uh, say something from the Machzer. Um, and of course, many of us will be experiencing a very different Rosh Hashanah this year. Um, are we going to be in Shul? Or how many of us are going to be in Shul? Where is Shul going to be, etc.? And you know that during the uh, repetition of the Amida on, for, for Musaf on Rosh Hashanah, we have uh, three sections. Uh, and they are three different sections. And at the end of each one, we blow the shofar. And at the end of the section called Zichronot, which is remembrances, uh, we say this. It's, it, we say a similar version, almost identical, except for the last couple of words, after each of the three major parts of the Musaf service on Rosh Hashanah. And we say, may the utterance of our lips be pleasing to you, Almighty, most high and uplifted, who understands and gives ear, who perceives and listens to the sound of the shofar blast, and accept with compassion and desire our prayers of remembrance. And seder can be translated as our prayers of remembrance, but it can also be translated as kind of the prayers of our memories. Part of what we do on Rosh Hashanah, as we imagine the year that's ahead of us, is we focus on memory. We focus on the importance of memory, of God's memory, of the kinds of people that we've been, which will, of course, come to a crescendo uh, on Yom Kippur. Uh, but we focus on our own sense of ourselves and how we've been, and also where we've, where we've come from. We're going to read, we read on Rosh Hashanah the story of Abraham and the binding of Isaac, uh, we read on Yom Kippur the story of the Kohanim on, in, in the temple, and we read the story of the martyrs. There is a kind of a tour through Jewish history over the course of the high holidays because memory is so critically important to us. And I suggest to you that this year, uh, whether you're in shul or you're davening from afar online or you're davening at home because you may not have any alternative, um, if you're in the machs or in any way, shape, manner, or form, look at the tremendous role that the distinctive memory about Jewish people and Jewish experience plays. And if we can do that, I hope, what we'll do is not only be inscribed for a healthy, which means a lot these days, uh, for a healthy and satisfying and successful new year, uh, but we'll be inscribed for a year in which our uh, bounty of resilience is perhaps renewed, a year in which we learn to uh, recover and embrace 
the tragic side of Jewish experience also, not because we relish it, not because we want it, uh, but because understanding that it is invariably part of our experience is part of what gives us what Fest calls our instinct for danger and part of what gives us our ability to rebound. Uh, we're living in a world in Israel, in America, in many other places uh, where the Jewish people tragically may be tested in its ability to rebound. Uh, and I would simply suggest that perhaps one of the ways of replenishing that well of the, with the ability to rebound with this notion of resilience is to embrace in a sad but powerful way the fact that we are a people with a troubled history for many, many years. We're likely to continue to have that kind of a complicated history. Uh, and the more that we accept that and embrace it and learn from it, rather than try to imagine a different world, the more I think we prepare ourselves uh, for the challenges that may still lie ahead. But the core, of course, I hope we prepare ourselves also for what it says here, a shana tova umetuka, a sweet and a healthy new year. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordas. Very, very interesting. And um, I think this point about the resilience being uh, what, what I would suggest, and certainly you are as well, uh, the, one of the top three most important secrets of the Jewish people. And the, the utter uh, and urgent and critical need to make sure we maintain the spirit that keeps that resilience alive. And so um, we have a whole host of questions for the next uh, 28 minutes. And our first one here, uh, emerging from Cheryl Hammerman, is around the question of um, the idea that the next generation of American Jews are increasingly more apathetic towards Israel. And number one, do you agree with that? And secondly, uh, what are the implications of that? Now, I'm, I'm not even talking here about those who or would be a far left anti-Israel young American Jews who think nationalism is the worst evil in the world and Zionism is a nationalism and thus Zionism is Nazis basically, right? But those who just have, uh, those who basically have, uh, have, have, uh, have an apathy. And so um, what does that mean for the future? Then build, connecting Rita's question here of the idea that I Israelis are more or less disinterested in American Jewish culture. Does that have any role in eyes also, that the fact that there's not a relationship? Is this just about U.S. assimilation, or is it also about the lack of a relationship? Do Israelis care about the apathy of, of young Jews? Does it matter at all? Is the sense that the future of Israel's security, uh, Israel security is tied to other places than the U.S.? So who cares if we lose this to some degree? Um, or that the evangelicals are, are the real partner, not the future of American Jews? Or is there some sense that an intervention needs to happen and Israel should invest in that? So that's a whole host of uh, intertwined things there. <laughs> All right, so that's the next lecture, which we'll start okay, Yes, okay, that. great. Uh, so uh, as Reb Shuli knows very well, I, I wrote a book about this. Um, so I actually purposely don't love to, uh, you know, a lot of people put pictures of their books in their slides and I just, I, don't, I plan not to do that so much. But uh, it's called We Stand Divided and it's literally about uh, the widening breach between American Jews and Israel. And I argue that it's not due to uh, current events, so to speak, but I argue that it's really due to um, much more longstanding trends. And um, Reb Shuli and I have actually had some interesting conversations about some of my claims in the book, some of his claims about this issue and so forth. So um, I would say, you know, again, without trying to, uh, you know, pander it too much, I would just say that, you know, if, if this subject is of interest to you, um, I did write a book about it and I try to make it an easy read. Uh, and if you do get a chance to look at it, I'd be interested in knowing what you think or whether you agree. Uh, now, to, but to try to answer the question a little bit now, do I think that American Jews are drifting away from Israel? There's no question in my mind. I mean, there are obviously some people who disagree with that. Um, the Ruderman Foundation, for example, which is composed of very, very smart people, um, have done some research and put out some data that suggests that American Jews are not drifting away from Israel. But most of the researchers uh, who write about this suggest that, yes, Israel, American Jews and Israelis are drifting far apart. And I think there's a whole array of reasons for that. And I obviously won't go into all of them now, but what I'll say on the American side is just to tie it to what we're talking about tonight, or today for you, tonight for me, uh, Israel doesn't make any sense if it, is dis if it is cut off from a larger Jewish historical tale. In other words, if you don't know anything about the betrayal of the Jews by Europe in the 19th century, in the 18th, and then, of course, in the 19th century, and to be sure, in the middle of the 20th century, if you don't know anything about the betrayal of the Jews by the world, 
everywhere the Jews went. Think about it. Name a great diaspora that did not end in catastrophe. I don't mean that just sort of faded away, right? But I mean the Babylonian exile, Sura Pumpadita, that gave us the Babylonian Talmud, really crumbles with the rise of Islam. Uh, the great Spanish exile, a diaspora, ends with the Inquisition and the Oto da Fe. The Polish community, which had been in place for six, seven hundred years and was the crown jewel of the Jewish world, of course, goes up smokestacks so that most people don't even have a gravestone. Uh, the, the, the incredibly important diaspora of North Africa ends in catastrophe shortly after the creation of the State of Israel, which is, by the way, worth thinking about from the point of view of American Jews also, because we always assume, well, this is going to end differently. Uh, I mean, I don't know why we would assume that. In other words, I'm sure the Babylonians thought that, and I'm sure the Spaniards thought that, and I'm sure the Poles thought that, and I'm sure the North Africans thought that. It's worth thinking about that. But Israel, Zionism is born out of a sense long before the Holocaust, right? I mean, 1897 with the first Zionist Congress is long before anybody's heard of Adolf Hitler. But Zionism is still born out of a sense that anybody who knows anything about Jewish history understands that the world will betray us. And um, if you don't want to acknowledge that, then on a certain level, Zionism doesn't make any sense. And I think that American Jews um, have understandably, but I think incorrectly, uh, believe that they have landed in the one place that they're not going to have to experience that. And I think uh, there are very serious warning signs. I wouldn't even say on the horizon. I think they're a lot closer than the horizon. Um, so I think from American Jewish standpoint, yes, I think American Jews are drifting away from Israel. And I think it has to do a lot with, uh, we do a terrible job of teaching about Israel. And I have a piece that I'm going to try to put out this coming week about that in, the, in times of Israel, probably we'll see. Uh, we do a terrible job of teaching about Israel. And I'll just as an aside, you know, this guy, Seth Rogen, the comedian, you know, he kind of got himself in a lot of trouble. And he said, you know, basically, this is what they taught me. This is what they taught me. That's actually true, by the way. He was actually telling the truth. What he was saying they taught is exactly what we teach. Uh, and it's therefore not entirely shocking that people grow up and have good minds and then get really, let's just say, annoyed, to be appropriate, um, at how they were raised. So I actually kind of felt sorry for Seth Rogen, even though I totally disagree with him in his final conclusion. I actually don't disagree with his analysis, and that's what I'll be writing about later this week. But yeah, we teach Israel badly. We teach history badly. We've tried to portray a world in which the Jews and this whole Tachanun thing, this whole suffering thing is no longer part of it. And then you could really ask, you know, who needs Israel? Um, so I think that, yes, American Jews are drifting away and history is part of it, not all of it, but is part of it. American Jews have wanted to see themselves really as Americans um, and Zionism was it to a certain extent to flirt with the danger of dual loyalties, which American Jews did not want to do, understandably, um, etc. Now, on the other side of the, of, of the ocean, I think Israelis are, are, are equally problematic. I think Israelis, in fact, don't really care about American Jewish culture. American Israelis don't even really know very much about American Jewish culture. They know very little, by the way, really about America, believe it or not. I mean, they know the Disneyland and, you know, whatever, and Silicon Valley, uh, but they don't know a lot about America. They don't understand at all, for example, what's happening about race in America now. They have no idea. They have no idea that slavery predates 1776. They have no idea um, that, you know, that, that as late as Lyndon Johnson, the great society, you know, made strides, but it didn't go very far. They don't know anything about the reconstruction and Jim Crow. I mean, a lot of Americans, unfortunately, don't know that stuff either, but one can't really understand America without understanding that stuff. So Israelis, it's, just, it's also true of their understanding of, of, of American Judaism. And don't forget here too, if American Jews were committed to being fully Americans, and that made Israel problematic, Zionism was created or was committed to ignoring or even destroying or ending the diaspora so that Israelis have inherited this notion that the diaspora is an, an aberration, right? Real Jews live in Israel, so to speak. I don't believe that, but that, that's kind of a, you know, a dumbing down of a more sophisticated Israeli, nuanced Israeli viewpoint, which really sees the diaspora as Hopeless. And this is not a Bibi Netanyahu thing. I mean, David Ben-Gurion said in December of 1960, he was enraged about something that American Jews had done. And he said, American Jews are going to disappear in a sea of assimilation and ignorance. 1960, David Ben-Gurion of the left, the socialist David Ben-Gurion, who American Jews love, he's the one that said that, not mean old, you know, Bibi Netanyahu or nice old Bibi Netanyahu, depending on what you're 
your perspective is. So part of it is that I think American Jews have been raised to think that we are now actually in the promised land. And you can look and see all kinds of examples of American rabbis talking about America as the promised land. A synagogue in San Francisco where Moses is seen carrying the Ten Commandments down, but not from Mount Sinai, but from El Capitan. And a rabbi in Charleston who says that we have now come to the promised land. America is our Palestine. He says in 1841 and so forth. So there are lots of examples of that. And Israelis, you know, the, the literature among Zionists about the denigration of the diaspora is a vast literature. I think both sides are making a terrible mistake. Both sides. I think that um, American Jews uh, need Israel for an array of reasons. And I don't mean they need a place to run to. They might, but they might not. Uh, but I think this, by the way, if you took Israel out of the equation of American Jewish discourse, what's left that gets people riled up? When I, when I was in rabbinical school, you know, will an Orthodox rabbi sit on a panel with a conservative rabbi or a woman, female rabbi? Nobody cares anymore, right? I mean, when I was, you know, when I used to live in America, will you eat Triangle K? Will you not eat Triangle K? I don't even know if they have Triangle K anymore. I've lived in Israel. They do, yeah, they do. They do, okay, Mazel them. You know, I don't know. <laughs> You know, when you just get people all bent out of shape, I remember Shabbos lunches in Los Angeles, you know, trying okay, and why is it not okay? Nobody cares anymore. Everybody does what they do. Nobody cares about any community other than their own. Take Israel out of the equation. Where's the lightning bolts, in the best sense of the word, in American Jewish life? Uh, and I think, by the way, that Israel has engendered America with a tremendous sense of optimism, Israeli American Jews, tremendous sense of optimism, and shin shin who come. There's a lot of ways in which Israel is the a spark plug for a lot of American Jewish life, and I wouldn't, wouldn't ignore that. Um, by the way, let's say by the same time, Israel is to me meaningful, not if it's a state of Jews, 80% Jews, 20% non-Jews, who happen to be citizens of the state of Israel. What's meaningful to me about Israel is that, yeah, there are certain Jews who are citizens and certain Jews who are non-citizens, but we are the state of the entire Jewish people. We have an obligation to the entire Jewish people. They don't all get to vote, they don't all pay taxes. They don't all go to the army. We don't have to do what they say necessarily, but we have to be part of a conversation. And I think that the Israeli dismissiveness of American Judaism is foolish, not because we need American Jewish support in Congress, which I'll come back to in a minute, which we do. But I'll tell you why some people say we don't, even though I disagree with them. Uh, it's because that's what Israel's purpose is. Israel's purpose is to be a, a sovereign entity that engages the entire Jewish people, those who live here and those who don't, in meaningful discourse about what Judaism should look like in the 21st century. Uh, and to say, oh, those American Jews, you know, they're going to disappear in a sea of, anti of, of assimilation, the way that Ben-Gurion said in 1960, which is, you know, right, it's, it's what, 60 years ago, uh, it, it, it seems to me to be not helpful. Now, why would Bibi Netanyahu, therefore, somebody asked about, you know, evangelicals and all that kind of stuff, why would Bibi Netanyahu, um, why would he be sort of hedging his bets and closing up to Putin and closing up to Modi in India and closing up to lots of people that American Jews sort of cringe, as by the way, do Israelis, uh, when they see Bibi cozying up to these people. Because one thing you can say about Bibi is he's not stupid. And he is uh, very savvy and very strategic. And he looks at America and he says, look, the Republicans you know, have the Senate, uh, have the Senate and the, the White House now, uh, but they might not. In, in a number of months. And if they win in a number of months, they're not gonna win forever. There's gonna come an era where the Democrats are gonna have Congress and the White House. And given where Bibi's assessment is of where the Democratic Party is heading, he says, I'm not putting all my eggs in that basket. And he says, who can I really count on? American Jews are angry at me. He doesn't mean me, he means Israel. No matter what we do, they hold up signs that say end of the occupation, but end the occupation how? I mean, I think what many people have not noticed is that even the UAE has now said, come on, I mean, this occupation thing, that's, you're playing chess on a backgammon board. We're now on the backgammon board. It's a whole new game. And if you're still moving chess pieces around, it's yesterday's, it's yesterday's conversation. I think what's profoundly important about the UAE agreement, whether it leads to Bahrain or Sudan right away, is interesting but not important. What's important is that the second largest economy in the Arab world um, has basically said, we're ready to look towards the future. Um, and the Palestinians are going to have to get with the program. And they're going to have to stop this business, which Hamas says and Hezbollah says and Fatah says of destroying Israel, etc. Because what Israelis understand, of course, is that it's not about the occupation. You could have the occupation tomorrow, and they still will tell you from the land, from the river to the sea, that's what they're going to liberate. 
And I think that a big test for American Jews right now is can they give up on that old narrative and understand that this is not about the occupation. The occupation, I'm not a big, you know, huge fan of the occupation. It's not good for them. It's not good for us. But do what about it? And therefore, BB says, when they hold up signs that say the end the occupation, what do they actually want us to do with Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in the north and Fatah in the West Bank? What do they want us to do? And since they don't have any idea what they want us to do, there's nothing in the world that I can do to assuage them. And therefore, he says, there's about 5 million, 4 million, 5 million, 6 million, depending on how you count, Jews in America, and there's 95 million evangelicals. So mm -hmm. where, what, do I need, what do I need 5 million people, some 70% of whom are going to vote for the party that is more hostile to Israel? Anyway, this is again, Netanyahu speaking, not Daniel Gordon speaking. The evangelicals, if I can make them happy, that's what I'm going to do. Now, again, I think it's a mistake in terms of Israel's long-term purpose. Um, but that's his, that's his argument. What we've gotten to by Israelis feeling that nothing that they can do will win the approval of American Jews is that they have really kind of hung, you know, hung up their hands, wrung their hands and said, okay, we're done and walked away. And I think it's terrible for both communities. And um, I think it's an important time for us, not only in terms of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur and you know, time of repentance and introspection, but the UAE actually could really be a control alt delete, not only on the Middle East, but in how American Jews think about the Middle East. Um, and if we could ask ourselves, what if we have to change about our own perspectives, uh, we could, I think, rebuild this relationship. But time is ticking. Um, and another generation from now, it's going to be too late. So all of us who care about this have to really roll up our sleeves and get to work. Very interesting. Very interesting. So picking up back on this issue of resilience, and um, of course, we need a balance between optimism and the instinct for danger. But thinking about the power of optimism in American culture as rooted in individualism of one's independence and one's instinct for danger connected to a collective history, a collective history of trauma and a current reality of insecurity. I wonder, firstly, going back to your interest in an article this week on education, how do we rethink engagement with unaffiliated young Jews? Because the approach today in American Jewish life is happy, fun, make happy, fun Judaism for young Jews. Give them a Shabbos dinner and give them some a beer and l'chaim and, and they're going to meet someone they want to date and whatever. It has nothing to do with the instinct for danger or for trauma. It has to do with getting people just to be happy and love this. And can that sustain the resilience? So that's the first part of the question. How do we rethink education in such an assimilated culture? The second is you talked about the warning signs, the warning signs that the U.S. Uh, American Jewish life could end in disaster. And what do you see as those major threats that are emerging? And is having our finger on those pulses also a crucial part of cultivating that instinct for danger? Uh, so the answer to the last one is yes, but we'll come back. Um, so, look, how to reach the young. I think what Judaism is at the end of the day is one of the world's most profound uh, wellsprings of meaning. Now, people think about the West. They think about, uh, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Hume, Locke, Shakespeare, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, Handel. Now, they think about the left, Picasso, Manet, Monet, you know, all of that. Like, wow, the West is this unbelievable repository of, in the arts and in literature and in history and philosophy, thinking about the human condition. And when I go to college, if I'm not in my basement or on my laptop, when I go to college, what's really fun about college is actually, you know, being with other smart people who are reading great books and having conversations, not in class, but, you know, around that proverbial beer that uh, Rabbi Shmuley just mentioned, to talk about the big questions of life. I mean, that's what a college education really is about. And I would actually say, if you um, want to know if it was worth the quarter million dollars that it costs to send your kid or your grandchildren to college these days in America, it's a very simple question about whether or not it was worth that money. Did they have those conversations? Were there big, profound questions that they thought about in college and read about and listened about and wondered about? And if the answer to that is no, then you just threw a quarter of a million dollars out the window because we live in a world today which can be very successful professionally. You don't even need a college degree. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. But um, I say that about the West because everybody thinks that's what the West is. It's this profound, thousands of years long conversation about meaning. And what's Judaism? It's like, you know, dressing up on Purim and lighting candles on Hanukkah and having latkes and having a uh, Shabbos dinner. No. I mean, Judaism is exactly the same thing. It's also an unbelievably profound culture. 
It's also an unbelievably rich, introspective look at the human condition. And it also has many voices. Now, we weren't so great in the plastic arts, it's true. Uh, but we did do some musicals. I mean, I found that rendition of Elysium that I played for you a little while ago haunting. Um, and if we weren't under pressure, you could have just listened to it. I mean, it's, it's just haunting. And some of what comes out of Israeli music these days is beyond bone chilling. Uh, but the Bible and the Talmud and the Midrash and, uh, and, and medieval Jewish philosophy and people in the modern world, whether it's Rabbi Soloveitchik or Rabbi Hartman or Abraham Joshua Heschel or, or, or Eliezer Berkowitz or whoever, I mean, there's so many different people. But we never got those young people to see Judaism as a serious, introspective look at, um, at, at the meaning of life. And the reason for that is, is we always thought, here's what we're going to do. We want them to go to, we really want them to get a Jewish education. So we're not going to make it five days a week because they're not going to really do that. So we'll make it three days a week. No, but then they're not really going to do that either. So we'll make it two days a week. And what happens is they learn less and less and less. <clears throat> they know less and less. And therefore it means less and less to them. Harvard does not try to increase its applicant pool by making it easier to get in. Right? The more competitive it is to get into Harvard, the more applications they get. Because if you do get in, then it actually means a tremendous amount. I don't mean that we should raise barriers, but we should respect our kids' intelligence. And I would just suggest this. Compare the educational experience that an American high school kid has when they take AP US history and the, and the intellectual experience that they have when they take some class in their Hebrew high school or whatever. I mean, AP U.S. history is a really serious engagement with the complexities of American history. It's incredible successes and it's haunting failures, both of which characterize America to this very day. And it's infinitely sophisticated. And if we don't give our kids the same thing in Jewish life and in Jewish education, why would they not walk away? I mean, people just don't do things that are A, not interesting, or B, that they're not good at. You know, when you're seven or eight years old and you're terrible at tennis, it's still fun to bang the tennis ball around on the court. But by the time you're in college, if you're not good at tennis, you don't play tennis anymore because it's just an embarrassment. Uh, and I think the same thing is true in Jewish life. We don't give them any skills for taking the library of Jewish books that is really their inheritance and learning how to navigate it. Uh, and therefore, the meaning of Jewish life <clears throat> doesn't come through. I think the way to teach Judaism and to reach the young is to increase the demands of Jewish education, to do stuff that's gonna turn them on. You don't have to give them the entire Babylonian Talmud in one weekend, but teach them something from a Jewish experience that um, they're gonna say, my God, I never thought about that question before. And I came to that important question from a Jewish text. What are these Jewish texts? Who are they? Who wrote them? Where'd they come from? Um, you know, so I don't have anything against Shabbos dinners, not anything against the proverbial beer, not anything against dating, if you're not married. <laughs> But, um, but I think that you're right. Those things are not going to do it. It's going to be meaning. And, you know, you got involved in it the way that you got involved in it because of meaning. I got passionate about it the way I got passionate because of meaning. You study Torah because of meaning. I study Torah because of meaning. Uh, we just have to get people to understand why we love what we love and not, you know, do it in a profound way for ourselves and our friends and our colleagues and then dumb it down for the masses because the masses are very smart. The masses want something. Um, so that's why I think it's harder to get people in. Now, what are the warning signs in America? Look, let's, I want to stay very far away from American politics. It's, it's a toxic environment. And, um, you sure? Really you more. sure it's so toxic? What's that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is quite yeah. toxic, yes. It's quite toxic. It's actually, uh, it, it makes Israeli politics look good. So thank you for that. Yeah, right. but in any event, but I don't want to get into the details of politics. But let's just be very honest here. There is profound anti-Jewish sentiment on the far right, and there is profound anti-Jewish sentiment on the far left. And let's be honest about both candidates, right? I mean, there's some stuff in the Trump history um, which is not great about the Jews. For him to get together with a bunch of Jewish leaders who are just saying, American Jews, I just spoke to your prime minister. He's not their prime minister. He's my prime minister. I didn't vote for him, but he's my prime minister. He's not the prime minister of all those people that he met with in Washington or on the conference call or whoever it was. To see the Jews as Israelis who happen to be living in America is one very small step away from, uh, you know, not seeing the Jews as authentically American. On the right, you have the white supremacist movement. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the, the, the white, don't, they'll be naive. The white supremacist movement are not great lovers of the Jews by any stretch of the imagination. 
But on the far left in the progressive world, um, you have the same hostility to the Jews. I mean, why is it that in, in Wisconsin now, in this city where there's all this rioting in the, uh, in the aftermath of the shooting of Jacob Blake, that the, the, the synagogue was spray painted Jews out of Palestine? What does Jews out of Palestine have to do with the shooting of a, of a black man by a policeman, a, a tragedy that we've just seen so many times? What's a synagogue got to do with it? Unless the hatred of corporate America is so deep and the Jews are seen as part of that, um, that it's really very problematic. And here's, you know, go back in history. Stalin hated the Jews because he said they were capitalists. And McCarthy at the same time pursued the Jews among others because he thought they were communists. In other words, and by the way, McCarthy and Stalin were both right. There were Jews who were capitalists and there were Jews who were communists or socialists. But the people on the far right don't like the Jews because we're not white enough American enough. And the people on the far left don't like the Jews because we're too white and too American and too established and too privileged, as the word goes. I think it's an extremely problematic word these days, but another conversation altogether. And look, I, I, am, you know, I, I will say this about my politics. I am very, very sympathetic uh, to the rage that the African-American Jewish community, the African-American community feels in America. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to it. Perhaps people on this call are in different places than I am. That's totally fine. Um, but I remember in 1968, my mom taking me in downtown Baltimore to see the burned out buildings in, after the riots, after King was killed. Uh, and I remember taking my daughter in 1992 in Los Angeles to the buildings downtown after the Rodney King riots. And that daughter just took her daughter down to Back Bay in Boston, where they're studying for a few years, to see the boarded up stores, not explain that story to her. I mean, when is this going to end? How many more generations does my little family have to teach their kids about what's going on? So I'm very, very sympathetic to the rage that African Americans feel right now. Very sympathetic to it. Having said that, to deny that there is an enormous component of anti-Semitism in the, in the Black Lives Matter world is to be equally naive, is to be guilty of that Joachim Fest accusation that we've lost our instinct for danger. Uh, there is danger on the right, there is danger on the left. There's more danger on the far right and more danger on the far left. And the only reason to stand up for yourself Jewishly at this point is because I think that this Jewish thing matters. And it's a sacred inheritance. And latkes are not a sacred inheritance. And Hanukkah gelt and, and hamantaschen or whatever are not a sacred inheritance. Sacred inheritance is thousands of years of learning and thinking and spiritual depth and communal cohesiveness, that's what I got a taste for it to be worth it for me to defend this. And I think if we try to pander or sell a very thin version of Judaism, it's not going to be worth it to Jewish kids to, to weather it or from the right or from the left. And the easiest thing is going to be to just dump it. Okay, and the, one, yeah. one final question for you. I'm sorry to cut you off. I want to squeeze in one question. If you can give just a quick answer to this. And, yeah. and it's really inspired by the, uh, your response to the, uh, to the Beinart piece around the end of a Jewish state, which is, I think we would more or less all agree about the value of a marketplace of open ideas. And I think we should also talk about there being limits. And right. so what is, what is an idea that you would identify from the far left of American Jewish discourse, which you would say it actually should not be welcomed in, in the Jewish space, in uh, Jewish blogs, Jewish synagogues and like, and what's an idea in the, in the far right of American Jewish discourse that you would also say crosses a moral line and should not be welcomed into our, into our institutional spaces? Okay, very similar, very simple. I would say they both have to do with Israel. On the left, it's the Peter Beinart line that he no longer supports the idea of a Jewish democratic state. Um, I think, again, if you see Jewish history the way I see Jewish history, the way the Zionists have seen Jewish history for the last 120 years, uh, then you understand that the Jews need a, a, a state to be safe. This idea that the Jews and the Arabs can live together in harmony with a joint government uh, is just ludicrous and naive, and it's, the, it's a risk that you only take with other people's lives. So I think it frankly crosses a line, and, I, and as I've said, I think it actually is somewhat treasonous. I know that's a strong word, but that's a word that I've used in public before about that argument that he made, so I'll use it again. By the same token, I would say on the opposite side of the spectrum, to say that I don't really care about the Arabs. You know, who cares about them? Or it's 700,000 of them, you know, got pushed out, left out, whatever, in 1947, 48, and 49. What do I care? I mean, they started the war. What do I really care? That's not a Jewish attitude. I mean, you cannot rejoice in the fall of your enemies. You can acknowledge that they're your enemies and still want them to have a better life. 
and you can acknowledge that they're enemies and still know that it's not good for our kids to be patrolling those areas. It's not good for our kids' souls. So I would say on the left, if you don't endorse the idea of the need for a Jewish state, I think you've crossed the line. And I think on the right, if you're embracing of the Jewish state, um, calluses you to the humanity of people who are not us, even to the humanity of people who might oppose us, that's also, I think, a bastardization of what the richness of Jewish tradition urges us. Wow. This has been so fascinating. We're so grateful for your time and thought um, uh, in this presentation. I want to thank you for giving us all of this time and deep uh, questions and insights. I want to thank Congregation Ortzion again for being our hosting congregation today. I want to thank the Hammerman family, Stan and Cheryl, for your leadership in our community and for keeping this lecture series alive and Eli for your presentation. And all of you for these amazing questions. I'm sorry I only got through a fraction of them. We could have gone on for a long time, but we will have to have Rabbi Dr. Daniel Gordas back again. Friends, we have more VBM programs than ever before. We hope you'll continue to join us on basically a daily basis. Thank you so much. Uh, good night to you, Lila Tov in Israel, and to everyone else. Have a great afternoon. Thank well. you so much. God bless. Shana tova. Shana tova, All the best. Call to.